Hey everyone, how are you? Can you hear me well? Perfect, great. Uh, my name is Amrit. Uh, I'm a product manager at Square. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, where I lead a couple of products over a few billion dollars in revenue. Uh, before this, I was based in East Africa, uh, working on uh, on a product called M-Pesa. How many of you have heard of M-Pesa? Wow, that's way more than uh, people know about M-Pesa in uh, in the U.S. Uh, where we also work with uh, small sellers and small businesses, uh, helping helping them grow. Cool. So I'll start with the story. This is Jackie, my friend, in, based in East Africa in Nairobi. She is uh, the co-owner of, uh, of, a, of a coffee shop called Pete's Coffee. And this is not a ripoff on the Pete's Coffee. It's, it's, it's actually Pete's name. Uh, and they're at the, kind of the tech center for, uh, uh, for Nairobi's tech ecosystem. So you know, if you're a tech geek in Nairobi, uh, if you look at their icon, it's a coffee in shape of a power button. Uh, can you see that? Uh, and so they've built this coffee shop over the last few years. And, uh, and Jackie has a family back in the countryside. So she lives in the big city, Nairobi, four million people. And uh, her, her little sister, who's still going to college, uh, lives in the countryside. So every month after uh, running this coffee shop, she would send money back home. So back in 2007, uh, a political tragedy struck Kenya. And there was a, a spate of political violence after elections. And, uh, and Jackie. I uh, used to send money using a personal courier. So she would literally hand wads of cash to a bus driver who would drive eight hours to deliver cash to her sister. This was happening for about 25 years. She's been sending money this way. And when the political violence happened, she couldn't send money back home, and her sister had to stay at home for about three months before the violence subsided, and then buses tried uh, applying again, and then she could actually send the money. Fast forward 10 years later, uh, all Jackie does is uh, picks up her $10 Nokia phone, a Nokia C18. Uh, this was my first one I bought when I was back in, back in college. Um, she picks up her phone, sends money, and it's delivered in five seconds. So 10 years forward, uh, Mbesa is now in 10 countries. It's moving about 530 transactions a second and 30 million million active users. So that's about 90% of uh, Kenyan adults and over nine more countries, so everywhere from Bangladesh to Romania, uh, and someday, hopefully, even in the US, we'll, we'll start seeing M-Pesa. So what's, what's changing this? What's driving this? Uh, before and behind any big change such as this, there are many factors that are more secular than the specific change. So when you look at the last 10, 15 years, the biggest change in this industry has really come from four billion people now owning a smartphone with affordable data. Uh, this has happened dramatically quickly in Africa and India, and of course in, in the U.S., where uh, you can spend anywhere from one to ten percent of your monthly salary just on data, as within someone's affordable range. Uh, there was a very interesting study recently that alcohol consumption in very poor neighborhoods and countries has gone down because people would rather spend money on data and entertainment than complain alcohol uh, than buy alcohol. Uh, so you can see what the competing kind of job to be done there is. So 4 billion people now on a smartphone, that's a huge change from uh, them being completely excluded from the digital uh, ecosystem and now have uh, access to essentially connect anywhere they, they want to. Number two, uh, the smartphone has dramatically lowered barriers to entry and distribution. What I mean by this is uh, today if you go to, let's say, a farmer's market in Hayes Valley or the Mission, your cookie seller or your, uh, somebody who's making homemade kombucha probably has a square reader, right? 10 years ago, if they were to start that business, they would be cash only. They would have to go to a bank, apply for a, a physical credit card terminal, uh, wait for two or three weeks, and most likely they would get rejected altogether. But today, they can pull out their smartphone, go online, order it, plug it in, they're ready to go. Uh, so really, the cost of distribution has completely, uh, marginal cost has essentially gone down to zero, and the cost to get started is completely zero. You see, this, uh, you see this effect even in uh, data centers in AWS, whereas if you were starting a company 10 years ago, the first round of funding would go to buying data uh, space and, and computing, whereas today, the same startup, no matter where you are, has access to world-class storage and computing thanks to AWS. So a similar effect is happening in, in, uh, in FinTech, where the smartphone, the supercomputer in your pocket is essentially the, the enabling device for a lot of uh, highly, highly specific applications. And number three, a, a better and responsible digital footprint. So people whose entire histories and lives were lying on paper ledgers somewhere in some loan officer's 
uh, daily logbook have now been digitized, and that's giving them the opportunity to participate. So three big factors kind of all related uh, in, in the same vein. So let's travel back to the US and understand what's happening with banking and, uh, and fintech here. And the best way to understand that is to go back to the, like, the late 90s. And you look at the, uh, the bigger ecosystem. How do banks actually work? They're, in, in economist terms, a financial intermediary. So they're essentially connecting capital to consumers. Uh, and they do it via several means, you know, everything from credit cards or savings account or bank accounts. Uh, and sometimes the consumer's deposits are also lent. Uh, so the core function of a bank is really managing risk on a capital and then doing it responsibly with a lot of regulatory oversight because banks have a demonstrative history of uh, taking too much risk or being too re responsible. There's always highly regulated bodies and there's a chain of regulators there from the Federal Reserve to the FDIC, state regulators, central regulators, uh, global regulators uh, that, that work on this. I mean, you think of how these banks actually delivered these services. They were all about physical coverage. So 15, 20 years ago, you would have your personal banker. You would go to that branch. You would meet that person. They would order coffee and tea for you. Uh, then you would talk about banking. And you had this like, really wonderful personal relationship, right? That was wonderful. That was like a concierge experience. You felt you were kind of the, the bank exists for you. And you had this like, really personal, lifelong relationship with that personal banker. However, that also meant people who were not of the same financial stature or the same financial capabilities were left out of the system. So because the bank's structure was all about physical access and building more branches and hiring more bank officers and having more ATMs, it was, uh, the cost structure determined that they could only serve people who had uh, quite a lot of money, uh, enough for, for them to be valuable to the bank. Right? Now, uh, so essentially the system here is very much the top 10, 20% of the population is being served, served really well, but the, lot, kind of the bottom 80% is not being served. Now when banking is no longer physically distributed, so the barriers to scale are not about buying expensive real estate in middle of cities and calling them branches, uh, the barrier is now building a great experience and providing a great uh, utility uh, digitally. What that uh, what that does is essentially when the costs have, have really plummeted, uh, you can dramatically expand access. So anybody who even is not earning you know, six figures a year uh, becomes uh, in my total addressable market as a, as a new digital fintech. So when you look at the bank and look at the bundles of services they were providing, there are essentially four or five big bundles. The savings and checking account, everybody probably has one here. There's payments, so P2P. Uh, that you want to make a payment to a particular business, you want to pay off a particular friend, you want to pay your electricity bill. You have credit and mortgages, or your credit cards, and when you need that kind of cash flow to, to uh, do big purchases or go to school, buy a car, and investment, so to make, put your money to work, uh, to make sure that your money is not just sitting there and, and, uh, and kind of getting decreased in, due to inflation. And all these services were provided by a big bank, essentially in a bundle, right? And uh, the way these worked, there were essentially different teams and different products of a bank that if you went to the, if you wanted to get a loan, you would go to the mortgage department of that loan. You don't go to that bank. If you wanted to get a credit card, you would go to the credit card department of that, of that bank. And that was not, not a very great experience because, hey, as a, sell, as a buyer or a customer, your opinion was, I am a person I don't think of my life in these very clearly defined silos. I have a financial life, and I want somebody to address that financial life, not this functional silo of, uh, of you know, savings and payments and credit and investment. So with uh, technology coming in at scale, essentially what you're seeing now is banking getting unbundled because with marginal distribution cost being zero, so it doesn't uh, cost, let's say, Robinhood any more money to serve a uh, million people versus of 100 million people, essentially, because it's, it's all about, you know, you can infinitely scale without having to add more branches or add more ATMs. Essentially, you're seeing that everybody's unbundling the bank and creating a highly specific experience for each particular product. So, good example of that. Saving and checking, you've seen things like Simple and Chime come along. In payments, globally, you're seeing this revolution. Uh, in the US, of course, Venmo and Square Cash is, uh, uh, are two big players who are kind of disrupting uh, payments from banking. Uh, credit, 
Uh, and of course, Paytm in India is a, is a big deal. They have about 200 million users now. Uh, and Alipay in China, uh, essentially taking a part of the bank and then bundling it and doing it really, really well. Credit is a big deal. Most people didn't have access to credit, uh, especially when they were uh, new to a country or they didn't have enough of financial life. So kind of caught up in this cash 22 situation is the only people who could get credit were people who already had the money, right? Uh, and now with new technologies where your digital footprint has been established, uh, lenders can lend responsibly to people who don't have a credit history. Uh, when I came to the US about three years ago, uh, nobody would give me a credit card or a bank account. My first credit card was from an obscure credit union in Washington state. Uh, I had to pay $500 to get $500 of credit. Uh, and that probably shouldn't happen to anybody else. But now with new technologies coming in, uh, why c can't you take all my statements from my previous life and then underwrite them? Uh, so companies like Branch and Tala uh, and many lenders in, in the US are trying to uh, find more signals to, to responsibly lend to people. And investment. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, if I wanted to buy uh, a really specific stock or a really, uh, really specific index fund, how many of you know what an index funds are? Okay, that's, that's, very, that's very good. So if I wanted to buy an index fund 15 years ago, uh, I would have to go talk to an investment banker. They would charge me 1%. 50% of all my gains would go to that banker. But now with Robinhood, it's all free, and I can buy it instantly. So dramatic, uh, dramatic expansion of access because the cost of serving marginal uh, customers has really plummeted thanks to, thanks to technology. And you're also starting to see many virtuous cycles start. So back at Copacopo, the startup I mentioned uh, in East Africa, we started with accepting payments. That let's, let's help small businesses accept mobile money. But it was really the start of a longer journey because when we got in and said, okay, we're gonna just serve this one thing really, really well, uh, you started to, to expand to the adjacent, uh, uh, adjacent opportunities. So what do you need as a business to really qualify and, and do your, do your work, best work? You need three things. You need customers, you need access to capital, uh, and you need some infrastructure, right? So you already have uh, infrastructure to accept payments. Based on that, we can very easily predict uh, how much you qualify for a loan because now you have, we have a history for you. They give you a loan, you use that loan to grow your business, hire more employees, buy stock on a game day, sell more food uh, during a particular, let's say, Valentine's Day. Your business grows and you take more payments. So this kind of compounding effect starts ensuing uh, based on one very clear uh, utility. And you see this pattern over and over again. You see that uh, as banks are getting unbundled, the new unbundled applications are bundling more things. So they're essentially on, on their way to becoming more ecosystems. All right, so I've talked a lot about uh, uh, what's changing in the industry. Let's talk about uh, how to actually build these products. So what's unique to building fintech products different from, let's say, building uh, a Facebook Messenger or Instagram or Uber? So at the heart of all this is developing cultural empathy. Because money is so, so personal to us. Uh, I, I use my mother's example a lot because she is hyper conservative when it comes to money. She would never invest it. She has most of it in gold. Uh, Indian mo mothers are notorious for keeping all their savings in gold. A terrible financial advice. Uh, but they're, it's highly, highly personal to them. It's like deep part of your psychology. So how do you develop that sort of cultural empathy uh, towards each culture's uh, treatment of money? Number two. Uh, provide a utility with trust. So trust is going to be a huge factor no matter what you do, whether you do investments, whether you do payments, uh, banking, P2P. Provide us the trust that banks used to have, that your money is going to be there, it's readily available, and that you can uh, track it with certain sort of certainty. And once you've built that trust, you're all set for the next step, which is to serve adjacencies. So, so to go deep and understand what is this money being actually used for, and then start serving adjacent needs around that problem. I'm gonna go double click on the cultural empathy part. Like how do you actually develop cultural empathy for, for money? Like how do you deeply understand what, what money means to someone? And, you, and, and Dan, I think before me talked about uh, how do you, uh, you, the best way to do this is to actually spend time with customers. And, and uh, so back when I was uh, working in Kenya, we would actually go and, and uh, spend time with uh, owner, owners of bars who said, I really want this loan because a big Arsenal game is coming up and if I buy more alcohol just during this time, I can make like 400% margin. You would have never known that sitting in a building trying to look at data, right? 
uh, and that's where actually the, our first, he was the first customer of our lending product. We gave, gave him our first loan. He used it to buy high margin alcohol for an Arsenal game and he paid it off the, uh, within like three months and the loan was back. So spending time with customers, really, really important. Number two, understand the emotion behind money. I've talked about this. Uh, what is the level of conservatism or aggression that, that a particular person has? How do they want their money to be put to use or not? And number three, write the financial diary. Uh, really deeply understand the broad picture of how this money is being used. So is this being used to cover somebody's school fees? Is this being used to, let's say, buy more inventory? Is this being used to go to college? Understanding these uh, deeper reasons of why money is being used, it un unveils more and more opportunities that you can serve. Uh, that uh, is, again, not apparent from looking at data because data is telling you what's already happened. And again, I've talked about this. Uh, once you start practicing this, you are essentially setting yourself up for this virtuous cycle uh, from there. Last but not least, FinTech is also infrastructure in its own right. So. FinTech, you know, building a great app, building a business on top, wonderful things, but it also enables other things around it. For example, if you wanted to do e-commerce, you can't do e-commerce without a great payment system, no matter where you are in the world. Whether that's cash on delivery in China and India, credit cards in the US, M-Pesa in East Africa, or, or bank uh, links in, in West Africa, you need financial infrastructure to make this work. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a Maasai woman in Kenya She's holding something called a prepaid solar lamp. So because uh, most of them are uh, agriculture workers, they don't spend time at, uh, at home during the day. So for them, a constant, always connected uh, electricity supply is not of that much use. So I'm out like 12 to 14 hours a day. However, when they come back, their kids need to, to study uh, for school. And there's no grid. There's no formal electrical grid that the government has set up to to actually uh, provide electricity 24 hours a day. So uh, Mcopa Solar, a company that spun off of, uh, of M-Pesa, it's not actually uh, comparable in size, they started uh, charging, uh, started providing solar uh, prepaid lamps. So the way you, this works is you can buy 100 shillings of electricity, pay it via M-Pesa, and the moment you've used up the 100 uh, shillings of electricity, it's about a dollar, uh, the bulb will automatically switch off. And you, even if the uh, battery is charged, you can't actually use it. So it's highly rationed understanding that uh, the marginal utility that this Maasai woman is getting out of that solar powered lamp uh, is, is of use only at a particular time. So it's a highly rationed way of doing things. And these have taken off like wildfire. Everybody uh, buys these on, on, uh, on a lease. So you can buy it and get this for free and then pay off the loans using M-Pesa again. You don't have to see a loan agent you simply just make your payments, and as long as you're making payments, you can get electricity, and it's all prepaid, and there's no grid. So uh, FinTech, again, an uh, enabler of many other use cases uh, that wouldn't have been possible without uh, solid infrastructure and, and adoption at, at scale. So where are we going from here? Uh, the f there are many patterns the next decade that you will see. Uh, number one that stands out to me the most is uh, a more leveled playing field. The tools that were available only to the very privileged 10, 15 years ago are going to be globally available. Uh, whether that's Amazon Web Services for a startup or a payment system that only were avail was available for you and I is now available everywhere in the world. So uh, more access to opportunity uh, and, and access to outcomes. Uh, you will also see uh, more of these new players that have uh, come up in the 10 to 15 years become their own incumbents because they have access to the data because they have access to the financial life, they'll start uh, serving more and more ecosystem. Uh, I don't know how this will pan out, uh, whether a certain ecosystem is more valuable than others, uh, but you'll start seeing everybody starting to build uh, ecosystems. Something like, you know, how many of you have used Credit Karma, for example? Right. Credit Karma launched a tax product because it's so close to monitoring your credit score and your financial health. They wanted to use taxes and same things for Intuit and things like that. Uh, number two, you will see that the highly tailored experiences will win over uh, you know, bundled experiences. So the world's best investment app, the world's best payments and financial app, the world's best checking account will be available for everybody. So you can kind of arrange the constellation of your, uh, of your financial life the way you want to. Uh, and number three, this is a personal prediction. I think data portability will become a lot more important. So currently, uh, 
your you know, financial data rests usually with your personal bank. Uh, in the future, you'll likely be able to move it as you want so that you can get the best experience regardless of you being you know, locked into a particular financial institution. So if I want to move my account from bank A to a FinTech B, I should be able to do it in one click uh, because that's my property, not, not the bank's. Uh, so three big things coming up. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, happy to chat. I'm on Twitter at PA1. And uh, yeah, feel free to hit me up on email. Thank you. <laughs>